Well, I want to briefly address uh, three topics. First, what is populism? Second, where does populism come from? Third, what can be done against populism? So, what is populism? Populism, so to speak, is the ugly brother of a wonderful girl. The wonderful girl is democracy. Populism is the bad and ugly brother. Uh, in both words, you have the people, once called in Greek, demos, that's really nice. In the other case, in Latin, populus, populus that's bad, of course. OK, so to, to, to be serious, there are three elements important for populism. The first element is the feeling, here are we, and there are they, the political elite, the political class, politicians, media people, intellectuals, and so on. The basic feeling is there is a split in society. Those above don't listen to us who are at the bottom of society. The second element of populism is the intuitive concept of a true will of the people. We below, we the people, we know what the will of the people is. We are not detached like these elites. Therefore, we are right. They are wrong. Our views should be given expression, not theirs. And the third element of populism is the phenomenon known quite well from Italian Renaissance, that the phenomenon of condottieri, people trying to gather soldiers around themselves to allocate power and to become important military or political figures. This type of political condottieri you find everywhere in populist movements. People who really want to be at the top of a movement, who want to allocate power to themselves, and therefore have no problem with expressing themselves in a very simple and even rude and sometimes even brutal way, such they can get to the top of the political system. This is what uh, Mr. Monti called populism from above, and the other thing is populism bottom up. What about the origins of populism? Well, to put it quite, quite bluntly, one of the origins, one of the reasons, one of the causes of populism is stupidity. There is a famous saying by a famous economist with the name of Joseph Schumpeter, who wrote that it's really remarkable how quickly a normal level of human intelligence goes down, even in case of very bright people, as soon as they deal with politics. Maybe you've done similar observations in your everyday life conversations. So it's a longing for simplicity. It's a longing for short answers to really big and complicated questions. The second reason, the second origin of the growth of populism is lack of responsibility. Lack of responsibility. I want to attract an audience. I want to attract followers. I want to come at the top of the political hierarchy. I want my party to end the parliament or to overthrow the present parliament, uh, the present government. Therefore, I don't care for the consequences of my talk. The most important thing is to generate followers. And this is clearly lack of responsibility because one day you have to act based on what you have proclaimed in the electoral campaign. The third origin, the third reason, the third cause of populism is what might be called, with a more analytical term, a gap of representation. What does it mean, gap of representation? To put it, again, quite, in quite simplistic terms, in a well-functioning representative democracy, you have on the one side a distribution of political opinions and preferences and so on among the population. And this distribution of political views and opinions among the population is mirrored in the political class. Therefore, all in the people have the feeling that there are politicians who take care of their views, of their interests, of their preferences. So they can have trust in their political class and in their political system. Of course, there is never full synchronization between the development of public opinion, of what people think, and the evolution, the development of what is current knowledge, what are the mindsets, the preferences within the political class. 
But usually, when election day is ahead, serious efforts are made to get a synchronization between what ordinary people or voters think and what the political class at least promises to think. But sometimes it occurs that for whatever reason, the political class either gets detached from what ordinary people think. This has much to do with the recruitment into the political class. If it is not possible to rise from the ranks of ordinary people by a well-functioning system of political parties into the rank of professional political class, then it's quite easy that professional politicians lose touch with the population. If the electoral system does not make sure that there is a very intensive work of politicians in the voting districts, then there is a significant risk that the political system is hovering above society. This is one way representation does not work, but that's not exactly what I mean by gap of representation. Gap of representation means that for what that for whatever reasons, within the political class, a certain spectrum of ordinary political thought is no longer covered. Maybe for reasons of political correctness. It's not correct to think in those terms. It's not correct to formulate such interests. It's not correct to give expression to such views. Or, another reason for a gap of representation, we do not see that there is really a problem. You say that you have a problem with immigration. Well, we don't have a problem with immigration. We need labor force. Therefore, we are right, you are wrong. You simply are cultivating xenophobic feelings, which you disguise as a concern for immigration policy. Therefore, we won't represent your xenophobic feelings. We know that we are right. This is a typical gap of representation which is at the base of present day uh, European populism. So having said that, let's come to the third element. What can be done? Let's start with ourselves. Our own contribution is a modest one, but if we combine our individual contributions, the effect might make a difference. Let's never talk, let's never express ourselves in populist terms. Let's never, in, let's never indulge in the longing for simplicity. Let's love facts and even complex arguments. Second, let's never embrace politicians who express themselves like political condottieri. Let's never vote for them. Let's always resist them. Second, and this is a more systematic approach, we have to detect and fill gaps of representation. We have to look where such gaps are. And in Europe, there are such gaps when it comes to immigration, to culture change, when it comes to the consequences of globalization, when it comes to the consequences of Europeanization, to the working of the democracy in European nation states. We have gaps of representation when it comes to reforms of the social welfare system. Out of all these sources, populist movements have arisen in Europe. The political class, so to speak, when accepting gaps of representation, leaves open space for populist movements, free land to be colonized by populists. So let's detect and fill gaps of representation uh, by sound policy making by no longer avoiding problematic or unwelcome political issues. And in order that the political class cannot be detached from the rest of the population, let's think about institutional mechanisms which make sure that elected politicians really have to keep in touch with the people. And uh, something like uh, referendums and so on might be discussed in this context. Third thing we could do is we should engage in close distance fight with populists. See, all of us are quite strong in long distance fights with populists. Everybody among us would subscribe a declaration against racism, neo-fascism, whatever else, xenophobia. This is what I call a long distance fight. We make declarations and say, well, we are the good and the brave. No, this is not sufficient. We must never exclude populists 
from roundtable talks. We have to confront them. We have tried to win our battles with them, vis-a-vis -vis of a big audience. We never must leave them alone in their, so to speak, echo chamber of populist thought. And basically, we need civic education. We need well-educated citizens who accept the complexity of political life, who wait for complex arguments, who do not long for alternative facts, but who long for facts, for real information about the complexities of political reality. And I think that if we engage in such a mix of strategies, from the modest ones to the more complex ones, we have a good chance to set an end to the rise of European populism. Thank you. Thank you. Αν και προβληματίστηκα λιγάκι από τις, από τις λύσεις που δίνει και πρέπει να τις συζητήσουμε, do not embrace populistic simplicity, είναι ένα ζήτημα αν και κατά πόσον μπορούμε να απευθυνθούμε στις μεγάλες μάζες χωρίς έναν βαθμό απλοποίησης και πού είναι τα όρια της απλοποίησης και του λαϊκισμού ε, και να μην, να μην εξαιρούμε τους populists από τα στρογγυλά τραπέζια. Στην Ελλάδα έχουμε ένα συγκεκριμένο πρόβλημα που συζητείται πολύ τι κάνουμε με τους extra, extra right populists, γιατί και η Χρυσή Αυγή, το ναζιστικό μόρφωμα της χρυσή αυγή είναι populistic κατά μία έννοια. Τι κάνουμε με αυτούς. Θα το συζητήσουμε μετά στο, στη, στη, στη συζήτηση που θα έχουμε.